Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode two of our podcast series. In our first episode, we discussed a case that was an important milestone in the world of forensic science, genetic fingerprinting. In this episode, we'll look at another way that genetic fingerprinting is an incredibly useful tool. Rosedale is a suburb that is about six miles from downtown Baltimore, Maryland. In 1984, the population of Rosedale was about 20,000 people. In the summer of 1984, nine-year-old Don Hamilton was living in the suburb. When Don was born, her mother, Tony, was 17 years old. Tony wasn't ready to be a mother, so she gave Don to a friend to raise. Her friend's only child, a daughter, had been killed in a car accident in 1982. The woman had officially wanted to adopt Don, but Don's father, Thomas, was opposed to the adoption because he wanted to be close to his daughter. In that summer of 84, Thomas and Don were living with some friends, a married couple with two children of their own. They lived in a townhouse complex in Rosedale. July 25th, 1984 was a warm, sunny day in the Maryland suburb. That morning, Don went out to play with her two young friends on the townhouse complex's playground. Sometime that morning, they decided to play hide and seek. Don was the seeker and she walked over to a pond across the road from the complex where two boys were fishing. There was a man with the two boys. He was in his 20s, he was tall, he had blonde hair, and a bushy mustache. The man had asked the boys to come into the woods with him, but they had refused to go. Don asked the man if he had seen a girl with blonde hair. He said that he hadn't, but he would help her find her. Then they walked off into the woods together. At 11.30 a.m., Don's friends went back to the townhouse where she was living and told Don's father's friend that they couldn't find Don. She did a quick search of the neighborhood, but she couldn't find Don either. So she called the police. Immediately, a search was launched. Over a hundred police officers and trainees, along with dogs, descended on the area. They conducted a door-to-door search. When his daughter went missing, Thomas Hamilton was at work. He was called and notified that Dawn was missing. He raced to the neighborhood and started searching the woods. He found her shorts and underwear hanging from a tree branch. The police searched the brush close to where the clothing was found. About 200 feet from the clothing, they found Don's body. The medical examiner and an FBI profiler figured out what most likely happened. They thought that the killer punched Don first and then he hit her head against a tree or some other stationary object. He then struck her at least twice in the head with a large rock. He then proceeded to sexually assault her. Semen was found in her vaginal and anal cavities. He then strangled her by stepping on her neck. This left a shoe print bruise on her neck. The horrific murder shocked the community. We're just going to take a break from this episode to bring you a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? I know for me, I have a problem being a workaholic and it drives my friends and family nuts. They complain I'm never present in the moment because my mind is always on work. They also think that if I don't relax a bit more, then the stress will have a negative effect on my life. When I signed up for better help, I was put in touch with a counselor very quickly. Often, you can start communicating with a licensed therapist within 48 hours. With my counselor's help, I've been able to work smarter and turn my brain off when I'm away from work. 
I have to admit, even just after a few weeks, it's made my life much more enjoyable. BetterHelp is available worldwide, and they offer a wider range of services. So you may be able to find a specialist that isn't available in your local area. It's also much more affordable compared to traditional therapy. You can communicate to your therapist through messages or even set up weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp, which is better, H-E-L-P, like the Beatles song, has a special offer for Into the Killing listeners. Get 10% off your first month by going to betterhelp.com slash listed. Why not close out 2020 on a high note by helping your mental health and help support criminally listed in the process by checking out betterhelp.com slash listed. The boys who had talked to the killer at the pond were interviewed by the police. One of them said that the man was 6 feet 5 inches tall, he was thin, he had blonde curly hair, and a bushy mustache. Based on his description, a composite image was developed. But there was a problem with the image. The boy who gave the description wasn't satisfied that it looked like the killer. He thought that the hair was wrong. He said it should have been more unruly. He also said that the man's mustache was bushier than the one shown in the sketch. Also, he said that the eyes were wrong. He said that the man at the pond had weird eyes. The second boy who was at the pond gave a slightly different description of the man. He said that the man was about 6 feet tall, not 6'5", and he had light brown hair, not blonde hair. But he did say that the man was thin and he had a mustache. Then the detective showed the second boy the composite image that was based on the description from the first boy. He said that the image looked like the killer. However, showing the sketch to another witness was against protocol. Nevertheless, the composite image of the killer was widely circulated. Another witness reported seeing the man that morning. She said that the man was thin, he had blonde curly hair and a mustache. But she said that the man was about 5'7 or 5'8, which is a lot shorter than how the first boy described him. The police also asked the FBI for a profile. The profile said that the killer was probably between the ages of 18 and 26. He most likely had problems with females for most of his life. He was probably single. If he were married, his wife would be older and his family would find her eccentric. If the killer had a job, it involved one with little contact with the public. He probably didn't worry too much about his physical appearance. At the time of the murder, something stressful may have happened which caused him to act out in rage. After the murder, he may have isolated himself or left the area. On July 28th, three days after the murder, the police received tip number 286. The caller said that the sketch looked like a man named Kirk who worked at a wicker furniture outlet store that was a few miles from where Don had been murdered. The detectives went to the store and they learned that Kirk was 23-year-old Kirk Bloodsworth. Kirk Bloodsworth was born on Halloween in 1960. He grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Bloodsworth was from a long line of watermen. Watermen are men who make their living from working on the waters of Chesapeake Bay. From a young age, Bloodsworth loved fishing and catching oysters, crabs, and frogs. In high school, Bloodsworth became muscular and athletic. He started doing discus throwing and he was good at it. He even won a national title among Christian schools. Bloodsworth graduated from high school in 1977 and he joined the Marine Corps. 
Bloodsworth was a member of the Marine track team for three years, and during those three years, he was the All-Marine Discus Throwing Champion. He was honorably discharged in October 1981. In April 1984, Bloodsworth married a woman who was 10 years his senior. They had only known each other for about two months. Bloodsworth's parents were upset by his decision to marry the woman, so they didn't go to the wedding. In July 1984, Bloodsworth was living with his wife, his wife's half-sister, his wife's two brothers, and one of her friends in a two-bedroom house in Rosedale. Bloodsworth moved furniture at an outlet store that sold wicker furniture. Bloodsworth's marriage was rocky. His wife would disappear for days at a time with different guys. Bloodsworth finally left her in early August 1983. He moved from Rosedale and he returned to his parents' home in Cambridge. We're going to take another short break to bring you a word from our sponsor, Green Chef. Many of us, myself included, want to eat healthier, higher quality food, but sometimes it's a pain to shop for all those ingredients, then prep them and cook them. Then there's the problem of food waste. When you throw out food you aren't going to eat, you might as well throw your money in the garbage. By doing it that way, it just saves you the step of going to the grocery store. These are the reasons why Green Chef is so great. Green Chef sends you recipes and ingredients that come pre-measured, perfectly portioned, and are mostly prepped. The recipes are easy to follow, and they come with photographs. Ingredients are seasonally sourced for peak freshness and delivered to your doorstep contact-free. That means you spend less time in the grocery store. With Green Chef, you choose the recipes, so it's perfect for keto, paleo, and plant-based diets, or even if you just want to eat healthier. Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company. Because of where I live, I can't get Green Chef myself, but our producer, Danelle, received several meals from them. She made a Thai peanut stir fry, which she said was great, and something she would have made herself, but Green Chef made it easier. It saved her several hours of shopping and prepping, but perhaps most importantly, she said it was delicious and satisfying. Needless to say, I'm jealous that she got the benefits for Green Chef instead of myself. You should check out Green Chef for yourself. Go to greenchef.com slash listed80 and use the code listed80 to get $80 off, including free shipping. Please help support Criminally Listed and eat healthier by going to greenchef.com slash listed80 and use the code listed80 to get $80 off, including free shipping. The detectives working on Don's case thought that many elements of Kirk Bloodworth's life and personality matched the FBI's profile of the killer. Bloodsworth was married to an older woman, and at the time of the murder, they were experiencing severe marital problems. Also, Bloodsworth left the area not long after Don's murder. The detectives also thought that Bloodsworth looked like the description of the killer. He had curly, light hair, and he was six feet tall. But there were significant differences between the description of the killer and Bloodsworth. Bloodsworth had noticeably reddish hair, and none of the witnesses mentioned that the killer had any red in his hair. Bloodsworth also had thick mud and chops, which is a notable feature. The only facial hair that the witnesses said that the killer had was a mustache. Also, all the witnesses said that the killer was thin, whereas Bloodsworth was stocky and muscular. On August 8th, the detectives working on Don's case surprised Bloodsworth by picking him up and bringing him to the Cambridge Police Department. Before the interrogation, the detectives purchased a pair of underwear and shorts that looked like the ones Don was wearing when she was killed. They also got a piece of concrete from the parking lot. When Bloodsworth was brought in for the interview, the items were sitting on the table in the middle of the room. Then they were quickly moved to the corner of the room out of his sight. 
The detectives did this because the FBI profile said that the killer would strongly react to these items. Bloodsworth was nervous because at the time, he was hiding marijuana in one of his shoes. The detectives asked Bloodsworth what he was doing on the day of the murder. Bloodsworth said he didn't exactly remember. He said it was his day off from work, so he assumed he was probably at home. They asked him if he knew Don, and he said he didn't. Bloodsworth said that the only thing he knew about her murder was what he read in the newspaper. The police then took a photograph of his shoe treads and released him. After Bloodsworth was released, according to several friends, he was freaked out about being questioned. He had assumed that the piece of concrete was the murder weapon, because why else would it be in the room? He told several of his friends that there was blood on the concrete. He also told some friends that he felt guilty that Dawn had been murdered. Bloodsworth explained that being questioned about her murder made her murder so much more real than when he had heard about it in the news. Two of Bloodsworth's friends spoke with the police and they said he had been acting strangely and he kept talking about the items on the table. They said that the piece of concrete with the blood on it had really freaked him out. But the detectives picked up the piece of concrete from the parking lot of the police station. So there was no blood on it. The police assumed that Bloodsworth seeing blood on the concrete was a manifestation of his guilt. The two boys who were at the pond on the day Don was murdered were shown a photo lineup. There were six color photos in the lineup, and one of those photos was of Kirk Bloodsworth. The other photos included a man who was clean shaven and a man with a beard. The other three men had similar features to Bloodsworth. The first boy, whose description resulted in the composite sketch, said that he didn't see the killer in the lineup. The second boy said that Bloodsworth looked like the killer. But he made a point of saying that the killer's hair wasn't reddish. The police decided that they had enough evidence to arrest Bloodsworth, so they got a warrant. At 2.45 a.m. on August 9th, 23-year-old Kirk Bloodsworth was arrested. After he was arrested, he was questioned for several hours and he denied committing the murder. He was subsequently charged with first-degree murder. He was denied bond. After Bloodsworth was charged, he was placed in a physical lineup with five other men. The other five men looked like Bloodsworth, but none of them had the same hairstyle. There was another massive problem with the lineup. After Bloodsworth was arrested, he was taken to the courthouse, where the press took photos and recorded video of him. So Bloodsworth's image was all over the local media. The police called the witnesses and told them that a man named Kirk Bloodsworth had been arrested and they shouldn't watch the news or read the newspaper. Several days after Bloodsworth was arrested, two women who said they saw the killer with the boys at the pond were brought in to view the lineup. On the morning of the murder, the women were both high because they had smoked marijuana. One of the women had already accused another man of being the killer because she thought he looked like the sketch. The police had investigated the man, and he was cleared as a suspect. The women had not followed the instructions from the police. They had watched the news and read the newspaper, so they saw several images of Bloodsworth and handcuffs. When the women viewed the lineup, they immediately identified Bloodsworth as the man they saw with the boys at the pond. Another witness was an elderly man who drove by the pond on the morning of the murder. He said he also saw the man standing with the boys who were fishing. He was brought in to view the lineup and he immediately picked Bloodsworth. However, like the women, 
he has seen Bloodworth's image in the news and in the newspaper in the days before he viewed the lineup. The two boys who were at the pond also viewed the lineup. One boy, who was clearly afraid, picked someone else besides Bloodsworth. Two weeks later, his mother called the police and said that he had been too afraid to say what he actually thought that Bloodsworth was the man he saw at the pond. The second boy didn't pick anyone out while they were in the room. But as they were walking out, the boy said he thought that Bloodsworth was the man he saw at the pond. Other witnesses came to view the lineup, but no one else picked out Bloodsworth. But the police thought that having five eyewitnesses was a strong enough case. For the next eight months, Kirk Bloodsworth sat in jail. Since he was in jail for murder, he was alone in his cell for 23 hours a day. Kirk Bloodsworth went to trial at the beginning of March 1985. The district attorney was seeking the death penalty if he was convicted. The prosecution started off by showing the jury disturbing crime scene photos. An FBI agent testified regarding the shoe print bruise on Don's neck. He said it may have been caused by Kirk's shoe. The problem was that the FBI agent was not an expert in shoe prints. He had only taken a one-day class on it and read a few articles about the topic. The five witnesses who said they saw Bloodsworth at the pond were also called to testify. This included the two women who picked him out of the lineup after he was arrested. They were also high on marijuana when they saw the man at the pond. Also, one of the women had accused another man but he was cleared as a suspect. Another witness was an elderly man who drove by the area and he said he saw Bloodsworth. He also only identified Bloodsworth after he saw him in handcuffs on the news. The two boys were called to testify. One of them said that Bloodsworth was the man he saw at the pond. The other boy, who described the killer, which resulted in the composite image, was asked if he saw the killer in the courtroom that day. He looked around, and he said he didn't see him. But then his mother testified, and she said he had picked out Bloodsworth in the lineup. The defense pointed out that not a single piece of evidence connected Kirk Bloodsworth to the crime. The prosecution said that the shoe print on Don's neck did, but the defense said that the FBI agent was wrong. The defense had the owner of a shoe store testify. He said that the shoe print bruise was probably caused by a shoe that was size 8. Bloodsworth wore a size 10 and a half. Five people testified that Bloodsworth was at home on the afternoon of the murder. However, many of these witnesses were not considered to be reliable. They were young people who liked to party, so they came across as burnouts. Then Kirk Bloodsworth testified on his own behalf. He denied killing Don, and he said he was at home on the day of the murder. His trial lasted for five days. The jury deliberated for two and a half hours. Bloodsworth was found guilty. He was sentenced to die in the gas chamber. He was sent to death row at the Maryland Penitentiary in Baltimore. Kirk Bloodsworth's conviction was automatically appealed because he had been sentenced to death. His appeal was heard on March 4th, 1986. Four months later, in July 1986, the Court of Appeals released their decision. They found several problems with Bloodsworth's trial. For example, the FBI agent should not have testified about the shoe print bruise on Don's neck. Also, it turned out that the district attorney did not hand over a report on another possible suspect to the defense. 
The suspect's shoe size was eight and a half and he had failed a polygraph exam. Not handing over the report was a violation of the Brady Rule. According to the Brady Rule, the district attorney must share any evidence that could possibly exonerate the defendant. So Bloodworth's conviction was overturned. The district attorney chose to try him again. Kirk Bloodworth's second trial started on March 24th, 1987. The district attorney's case was very similar to the case they presented in the first trial. The difference was that this time, the district attorney did not talk about any of the forensic evidence like the shoe print. All five eyewitnesses testified again. This time, Bloodsworth didn't testify on his own behalf. Part of the reason Bloodsworth got a new trial was because the district attorney didn't hand over a file on another suspect. The defense called that suspect to testify. Bloodworth's lawyer was hoping to create reasonable doubt by casting suspicion on him. However, the other suspect was able to provide an alibi for the time of the murder. Bloodworth's lawyer didn't have any of Bloodworth's alibi witnesses testify. His lawyer thought that they came across unreliable in the first trial and he thought that they were one of the reasons he was convicted. Bloodworth's second trial lasted for two weeks. The jury deliberated for six hours. He was once again found guilty. This time he was spared the death penalty and he was given two life sentences. Bloodworth's lawyer appealed once again. The appeal was heard in April 1988 and Bloodsworth lost the appeal. It looked like Bloodsworth was going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Kirk Bloodsworth got a new lawyer, Bob Morin. Around the time that Morin was hired by Bloodsworth, he had learned about a new investigation tool called genetic fingerprinting. Morin told Bloodsworth about genetic fingerprinting. This led to Bloodsworth reading the book the Blooding by Joseph Wamba. The Blooding is about how DNA testing was used for the first time in a criminal case, which is the case we cover in our first podcast. After reading the book, Bloodsworth became obsessed with genetic fingerprinting. He wanted the evidence from his case to be tested. Morin eventually found a lab in California that could do the testing. In August 1992, Morin sent the evidence to the lab. He ended up paying $10,000 out of his own pocket for the testing. In January 1993, Kirk Bloodworth still didn't have the results from the DNA testing and he was still in prison. Sadly, his mother passed away that month. He was allowed to leave the prison to pay his respects to his mother at the funeral home and then he was taken back to the prison. A few months later, in April 1993, Bob Morin called Bloodsworth in prison. The DNA results had finally come back. None of the DNA found at the crime scene belonged to Bloodsworth. The FBI did their own testing. Two months later, they made the results public. They concurred that the DNA did not belong to Bloodsworth. Kirk Bloodsworth was released from prison on June 28, 1993. He had spent nearly nine years in prison. Two of those were spent on death row. Bloodsworth is the first American to be exonerated of murder that they didn't commit thanks to DNA evidence. After Bloodsworth was released, he appeared on several nationally syndicated talk shows. He also became an advocate against the death penalty. Six months after Bloodsworth was released from prison, the governor granted him a full pardon. 
Budsworth was given $300,000 by the state, which is about $33,000 for every year he spent in prison. In February 2000, Budsworth traveled to Washington, D.C., where he talked about his experience to support the Innocence Protection Act. The act would create a budget to allow inmates to get DNA testing done on evidence from crimes they had been convicted of. The act was signed into law in October 2004. So while Bloodsworth was freed from prison and exonerated, there was still a question that needed to be answered. Who killed nine-year-old Don Hamilton? In June 2003, Kirk Bloodsworth had been out of prison for about 10 years. On the anniversary of his release, the newspaper, The Baltimore Sun, published an article about Don's murder and Kirk's experience. The journalist who wrote the article posed the question, why hadn't Don's killer been found? After the article was published, investigators ran the killer's DNA in the combined DNA index system. They found a match. After 19 years, Don Hamilton's murder had finally been solved. The DNA belonged to a 45-year-old man named Kimberly Ruffner. Bloodsworth knew Ruffner because they had been incarcerated at the same prison. Ruffner's cell was on the tier below his own cell. Ruffner had spotted him while he lifted weights. Also, Bloodsworth had worked in the library and he brought Ruffner books. On the day Bloodsworth found out he was getting released from prison, Ruffner congratulated him. At the time of Don's murder, Ruffner was 26 years old. He lived about six miles from where Don was living. He had been arrested twice before Don's murder for sexually assaulting young girls. He had been arrested for sexually assaulting a teenager, but those charges were dropped. In November 1983, Ruffner was arrested after an 11-year-old girl had been sexually assaulted. He went to trial in July 1984. It ended in a mistrial because the jury was deadlocked. Two weeks after his trial ended, Don Hamilton was murdered. Six weeks after the murder, Ruffner was arrested again. He had stabbed a woman while he was attempting to rape her. She survived the attack and Ruffner was arrested. For the crime, he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. He was serving that sentence when he met Bloodsworth in prison. In November 2003, Ruffner was indicted for the murder of Don Hamilton. Ruffner made a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to first degree murder in exchange for life in prison instead of the death penalty. Ruffner will have to start serving his life sentence after he serves his 45 year sentence. Kimberly Ruffner is currently incarcerated at the Eastern Correctional Institution in Westover, Maryland, which is a medium security prison. Kirk Budsworth currently lives in Philadelphia. He is the executive director of Witness to Innocence. Witness to Innocence is a nonprofit anti death penalty organization started by famed anti death penalty advocates, Sister Helen Prejohn, and the 100th person exonerated from death row in America, Ray Crone. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Our producer and sound designer is Danelle Cloutier. If you just found our podcast, please check out our YouTube channel. We have over 250 videos featuring some crazy true crime stories. Also, please don't forget to subscribe or follow our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. Next week, we'll step away from genetic fingerprinting to discuss two strange cases that were solved after decades without the benefit of DNA evidence. But that's all for this week. Thanks again for listening.